All right. Hey, everyone. This is Tony from SOVHorror.com, and welcome to the SOV Horror Podcast. Today, we have a really awesome guest. We have Mr. Jeff Kirkendall. You may uh, recognize him from some of his work with uh, Mark Polonia, as well as his directorial work. And uh, we're going to be talking to Jeff about a bunch of that stuff today. But before that, let's get into the SOV Horror Plug, get it out of the way. So uh, I hope everyone had a happy uh, Halloween. Uh, by the time you're watching this, Halloween's probably came and went. Hopefully you got to watch a lot of cool horror movies. And, uh, but we got some really cool new stuff coming out for November with SOV Horror. And uh, up first, we have a movie from Henrik Kuto. It's one of his first movies. It's called Slumber Party Murder Mania. And he made this when he was just a teenager. This one's a lot of fun. It's kind of like a slasher made by teens. I think uh, if you like things like AmeriKill or the work of Johnny Dickey or Michael Bellamy, I think you really dig this. It's loaded with special features, commentary, uh, trailer reel, a making of doc that's even longer than the movie. So uh, definitely check this one out. And then also on November 13th, we have Natasha Knighty's Boudoir of Blood. And this is the follow-up to our first in-house production, Zombrella's House of Horrors, which uh, features stories by the great Jeff Kirkendall is with us today, as well as Ron Ford and myself. So definitely pick these ones up, guys. These are coming out November 13th at SOVHorror.com. It's the only place you can get them. All right, so we got the plug out of the way. Uh, so uh, I got to introduce our guest today. Um, I first became familiar with our guest work probably, I don't know, close to a year ago. Um, mainly, uh, I had seen you kind of around Facebook and, and your involvement with uh, the Mark Polonia and stuff. And then I looked into your, your films that were distributed by uh, David Sterling, such as The Temptress and Halloween Horror Tales. And yes, we are talking to Jeff Kirkendall. Hey, Jeff, how are you doing today? Very good. How are you doing, Tony? I'm doing great, great, Jeff. I'm really stoked to have you on today, and uh, it's really cool to have you on. Um, so I guess first of, uh, you, obviously we kind of already mentioned it, but you're involved in the N Natasha Knighty movie, and you were cool enough to contribute a couple shorts to it. Uh, in particular, the one that's actually in the film is The Green-Eyed Monster. So um, can you tell me a little bit kind of what was the genesis for The Green-Eyed Monster? Well, that was one of my early short films um, back in the 90s. Um, I shot that around, I think, 1998, um, 1998, 1999. And we were actually shooting that concurrently with another short film I did called Three to Murder, which became uh, the uh, prequel for The Temptress. And uh, we were shooting that on uh, analog video, VHS, eight millimeter cameras. Uh, my friend Tim Hatch had the equipment and uh, he was the producer on those, and I wrote the scripts and did the directing. And uh, we, did it, uh, we did it locally in the Albany, New York area. And they, the, that was a sus kind of a suspense horror type of uh, story. Uh, just an original idea I had. Uh, it deals with uh, jealousy, basically. It kind of goes with the title. Right. And uh, yeah, that was a, one of the more fun movies that we did. We had some nice zombie makeup effects in it too. Some of the actors contributed to that. And uh, it was a lot of fun to make. Yeah, one thing I really liked about it when I first saw it, so uh, w the way we kind of got it is I had been talking to you about distributing some of your stuff potentially, and you had sent me that one to check out, and I thought it was perfect for the Natasha Knighty movie, in particular because I felt it went very well with my short, which at the time was the only short in the project, my short called Typeface, which was about a kind of a possessed typewriter, and yours kind of has like, it's not really a possessed radio, but there is a radio that's kind of this demon is kind of manifesting himself through it that I just thought was really cool. And I, what I really liked about yours is it's very story driven. And in the genre today, you know, a lot of people just go for kind of cheap thrills, such as, you know, just gore or sex and stuff like that, where I, I really enjoy that yours was story driven. And, you know, is that something you try to kind of focus on more in your work is kind of like story over exploitation? I do, I do focus on story quite a bit. Um, I think it came from, I started, uh, I started working on independent movies in the mid nineties. And I think a lot of it came from, I was taking communications in college and I took a lot of those type of classes, uh, uh, the short story, story writing, as well as video production, that type of thing. And um, I think the first thing I wrote was a, uh, 
a 30 minute drama for communications class. And I think it all kind of started from there. Right after, right after graduation from college, I started writing scripts. And I think they were, they did tend to be more story driven based on, you know, what I had, uh, what I had taken in college and that, those kind of things, film classes and so forth. Although I, was, I wasn't a film major, it was a communications program, but there were a lot of those type of courses in it. So I think, I think that's where a lot of that might, may have come from. Gotcha. So was the, you kind of mentioned you were into communications and all that. Um, were you kind of attracted to wanting to make films or, or was that kind of something you more kind of found that calling as you were studying communications? Well, I was always a big fan of movies and TV. Um, and then when I took uh, communications in college, you had to take a couple of technical classes and the ones I chose were video production. And I think I realized at that time after those classes, you could actually, you could actually shoot something yourself and produce it. It didn't really click with me until then. Uh, so I did, I shot a couple of things in, in the college classes. And then right after that, I had the idea, hey, I, I, sh I can go out and make something myself, you know, uh, you know, a movie type of thing. And around the same time, I was also uh, studying acting and theater. And I got to know some of the independent filmmakers in our area who were getting into movie making. And I think a lot of things just came together. And uh, that and I was a big horror fan at that time too, a really big horror fan. So it was natural that it, I would gravitate towards suspense and horror movies. Right, cool, cool. And, and you know, you, you kind of started in the late 90s when it was still analog video. And was that kind of pre nonlinear editing when you started? Oh yes, yes. Uh, when, when, I, when I was taking the video production courses that the college was still using uh, VHS equipment. They had the, the linear editing decks and, you know, the quote professional video VHS equipment, but it was still a VHS analog type equipment. So right. I did learn that kind of editing. And so I made a few things in the late nineties. And then I think I got my first uh, digital camera around 2000. And then I went on to producing digital movies. And of course the computers came into being then and everybody moved over to uh, the nonlinear editing. And I started uh, I think it did help a bit having had the experience of the other before that. Right, yeah, I was gonna ask that because you know, one thing I don't think a lot of people of today realize, you know, they, they got camera phones and uh, a lot of free programs where you can pretty much do editing, special effects, a whole bunch of stuff, realize the challenge of editing with, without a nonlinear uh, system, you know? Right, right. Yeah, those, yeah, those were uh, the good old days, I guess, you know, <laughs> you, you had to uh, put everything together in sequence. And if you made a mistake, sometimes you would have to go back at the beginning and start over again. Uh, and the cuts weren't always accurate and so forth. But, but it was a good training ground, I think. I, I think it was a good introduction. And I'm glad that it worked out that way, you know. Right. So, now, yeah. did you, before you kind of started doing video, you know, video shorts and video movies, had you seen any shot on video movies before then? I, I'm going to say no. Um, I remember, well, I have a little story about the first shot in video movie that I, I saw. Uh, I, I started reading uh, Fangoria magazine in the 80s. I was a big horror fan. And then in the mid 90s, I started going to their weekend of horrors conventions in New York City. And I think it was, I think it was 95 or 96. I remember I, the first one I went to had a lot of the Elm Street actors there. And I was a huge Elm Street fan. So that's what made me go to that. But what I didn't realize was in the in the um, merchandise room were these people, these independent filmmakers who were actually making movies shot on video. And I was just getting interested in it that that time, and uh, I think one of the, so I was surprised to see see these you know movies that were completed and they were selling them on you know VHS and all that. And I think the first one I watched that I bought at a convention watched was a movie called Psycho Sisters that was shot on VHS. I remember the table, the, the director was there, Pete J. Sloan, the three actresses from the movie. I bought that movie, and then I met a few other filmmakers at that convention too. Uh, Bill Hellfire was, I met, talked to him and his girlfriend, Aaron Brown at the time. But I was, uh, I was just shocked that, you know, people had done this already. And I remember watching that movie. That was the first, I think, underground, well, underground movie that I watched. <laughs> Nice. So, yeah, that, that one's kind of considered a classic these days. You know? <laughs> it was quite different <laughs> than anything I've seen. 
<laughs> wave movies are, are definitely a, a different cup of tea. That's for sure. If anyone hasn't seen the, the wave style movies, uh, the best way I can describe them is they're almost fetishistic type uh, horror films, you know. Um, but yeah, that definitely. one I think it cool. Did you ever see the remake of that? They made a remake, uh, I think, a few years later that was actually shot on film. No, I, I have not seen that movie. No, I haven't seen I, I know they did a remake. I haven't seen it, though. It's really good. It's it's actually radically different than than the original one. <laughs> cool, cool. So uh, according to your IMDb, and I never trust IMDb that much because I like to call it the inaccurate movie database. God knows most of my credits aren't even up there, and I know a lot of people are the same. Um, it, it, Green-Eyed Monster, was that kind of your first real kind of a short film that you, that you kind of completed? Uh, Night Therapy was the first short film that I Night shot. Night Therapy. Uh, I shot that, I believe I shot Night Therapy in 1995. And then the other two, Green Eye Monster and Three to Murder, next year or the next couple, within the next couple of years. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and Night Therapy is actually a bonus feature on the Natasha Nighty DVD for people who are maybe interested in picking that up. And that's another good short. I, I really enjoyed that one as well. And uh, kind of what was the genesis for, for Night Therapy? Well, uh, it was just an original idea I had uh, for this story about uh, about these uh, people who visit this therapist and they tell their stories about uh, their interactions with this guy. And it, the story involves a severed head. And it was just an original story idea I had. And it turned out to be maybe a little more comedic, kind of a horror comedy because I know when I've shown it many times, I think that one gets more reactions than any movie I've shown at screenings because it's kind of, it has, it's kind of a one joke, Stephen Wright type of joke, type of movie. And uh, it's very deadpan. And it just, it was just kind of an original story idea, but I don't know where, it, I don't know where it originated from. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> and, and you played uh, the therapist in that one. And that kind of leads me to, did, did you play that role out of more out of necessity or more out of you actually kind of went into it knowing you wanted to play that specific role? Uh, it was probably a little of both. Uh, you know, like so, some other independent filmmakers, I had uh, a few people, a few actors that we worked with, and then I would take parts as well. And I thought, I thought on that one, my friend Tim Hatch, the producer, was going to do a lot of the behind the scenes work. So I thought I'd take care of the main role myself and then cast the other roles. It, it was kind of more of a necessity, but it did seem at the time like a role that I that would kind of fit my acting style. So a little of both, I would say. Nice. Now, how did you, did you originally distribute those yourself in any medium? How, how did you go about uh, distribution on those early shorts that you were doing? Uh, I used to sell them at live shows or, or screenings and, and film festivals on VHS. I had a number of a batch of duplicates made on those early movies and we would sell them at the shows. And then later on when the internet came into being, I did self-distribution of those movies on DVD. Um, I sold through a company called, it was originally called Film Baby and I think it's called CB Baby now. But oh, okay. uh, yeah, you, you basically make the dupes yourself and you know, self-distribution. Right. And, and so was your, did you try to seek out distribution for those at all at the time? Or did you want to control the distribution kind of on your own? Well, I think, I think part of it was kind of necessity that there didn't seem to be as many accessible distributors at the time, or at least I didn't know of them. Right. Uh, and I'm kind of a do it yourself person. So I kind of, uh, you know, just said, well, you know, I've got the movie, I'll, uh, have, have duplicates made and sell them on my website and that type of thing, sell them at shows. And then I think as years went by, I became a little more knowledgeable about distributors. And, and then eventually when social media came, came into being, it was easier to see what people were doing and where, where these distribution options were. Uh, so, you know, it kind of evolved with over the years. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. So, uh, you know, your first official full, full length I got right here, uh, The Temptress, and this was put out by uh, Sterling Entertainment just recently. Uh, you you want to tell us a little bit? I, I know Three to Murder is kind of like the, the, the prequel to this, so I guess maybe we kind of touch on uh, Three to Murder first. Uh, you mentioned it was done kind of around the same time as Green-Eyed Monster. Um, 
So you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Three to Murder? Sure, sure. Yeah, we were we were filming it at the same time, and that uh, Three to Murder is kind of a uh, a hybrid crime drama horror movie. It, it kind of uh, goes as a crime drama most of the movie, and then there's a horror twist at the end. Uh, it, I guess it, it's a little bit maybe like uh, a, 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 like the movie From Dusk Till Dawn, that type of thing, but like a zero budget version of <laughs> a short film version of Till, um, um, From Dusk Till Dawn, if I could compare it to any movie. Uh, and then what I did for The Temptress is um, I took several of the characters from Three to Murder and put them into a bigger script. In fact, if you watch The Temptress, there's a scene probably about a quarter of the way into the movie that picks up directly from Three to Murder. But it's set up so that you don't have to have seen the, the, the first movie. If you have, you, you'll see where it picks up. But if you have it, The Temptress, I made it so it was a standalone uh, story. I like the, uh, the vampire idea, so I wanted to do a feature-length vampire movie, Femme Fatales, and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's where uh, The Temptress came in. And that was another movie I've been distributing. I think that one, that one I always distributed on DVD because we shot that around 2000. Gotcha. Between 2000 and 2002. So by that time, it was DVD. So I was self-distributing that movie. And then a couple of years ago, uh, when I uh, pitched Halloween Horror Tales to David Sterling, I told him I had this other movie, uh, The Temptress 2. Uh, because it was just being self-distributed and he you know was uh he liked it and took that one too so nice i actually so i made the mistake of when i watched the temptress or maybe it wasn't the mistake but so i watched the temptress first and on the sterling dvd three to one or three to murder is a bonus feature on there and so i watched that one kind of afterwards and 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 so it was kind of interesting seeing how it was like you said, you don't need to see Three to Murder to enjoy The Temptress, but it is kind of a cool prequel. And I recommend if anyone hasn't checked it out yet and plans on doing so after this to probably watch Three to Murder first, because I think it kind of sets up the, the Temptress a little better. It's just in my opinion, but it definitely is a standalone. Both of them, you know, are st kind of standalones, uh, work of arts on their own. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a uh... I think they're both fun movies and, you know, they have uh, some, some interesting characters and I try to put a lot of action in it. And, and I think there's more like blood and gore in the temptress maybe because the three to murder, it's kind of, it's kind of more violence without that until the very end, there's a little bit of that. And right. then, like I said, uh, the temptress is more, uh, you know, full on vampire movie. So you would expect to have more of that. So, you know, right. I hope, uh, people will enjoy it. For sure, for sure. And then, I mean, it's Halloween season, and uh, obviously we got Halloween horror tales here as well, but uh, Mel Heflin here on the cover, she's also in the Natasha Nighty movie. And, um, you know, one thing I noticed, I, I want to ask you about kind of how that came together, but when, when I watched the movie, I did notice that the titles just say horror tales. I didn't see Halloween on there. So was that kind of added after the fact? Was that kind of like added by Sterling? as a marketing thing? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, I submitted uh, I su submitted the materials to Dave as horror tales. And I think I, I think on one version he, uh, well, the, the box says he added Halloween horror tales. Right. I think on one version, either the DVD or the Blu-ray, he added the Halloween to the main titles. And I think another version, it may just say horror tales, but it was originally uh, just horror tales. And when he got it, it was around Halloween 2018. And he put it out just after Halloween, and I think that was uh, what he wanted to uh, to do for the marketing on that. Right, and you know it it does really it, you know it does really kind of fit the Halloween vibe pretty well. I mean, I, I've always thought that horror anthologies in general are just great movies to watch during the Halloween season. I mean, one I like to watch a lot during Halloween is a like Creep Show, you know, which I think is a classic horror anthology, and. Uh, so I, I, it was just kind of weird not seeing Halloween on the DVD copy. I'm presuming it is on the, the Blu-ray, as you mentioned. But, um, you know, yeah, so I, I definitely wanted to ask about that. But there's some really cool stories in there. Uh, the one that really stuck out to me was uh, the clown story, which I thought was a lot of fun. And uh, you, you want to kind of tell us a little bit? Because uh, I did from what uh, some of the research I did, it seemed as though some of these, I know one of them, like the undead, was kind of a standalone short for a while and then was incorporated so how kind of did the whole anthology really kind of piece together well that was a movie i started working on 
around 2009. We shot, I think, a couple stories in 2009. Yeah, two of them in 2009, and then the third one in 2010. And then there was a huge, uh, a huge gap until early 2018 when I finished the last one. Just, just no, no particular reason. Just life things that got put aside for a while. Um, and the, the first one I finished the editing on was actually the last story in the anthology called The Hunt. And I, I thought it came out so well, I just put it together with opening and ending credits and showed it a few times locally and sold some copies at conventions and things. And then after that, I finished the rest of the movie and, and then it became, the, you know, the anthology. But uh, yeah, three of the stories uh, we did earlier on and the um, the one that Mel Heflin is in, uh, the horror hostess, we did in 2018. The other three were done here in my area with mostly people around this area. And then um, the horror hostess we shot in Pennsylvania, my friend Mark Polonia helped me finish it up and and we got a few of his actors in there. So and then it was all pieced together. So it, it kind of it was a long gestation period for that movie, but it all worked out in the end. So. Yeah, and it's a, it's a lot of fun, and I definitely recommend people, you know, go check out the Sterling uh, website. He's got a Kunaki page, and you can get both of these DVDs. They're a lot of fun. Uh, I, I definitely recommend them myself. And uh, you kind of kind of brought me into my next topic. You kind of mentioned Mark Polonia there, and uh, obviously I'm pretty sure fans of, of this podcast will, will definitely know who Mark Polonia is. He's kind of a legend in the shot-on-video film world. Um, how did you hook up with uh, Mark? Um, Mark? Mark and I met at a film convention in Albany, New York. Um, the, the building that I work in uh, has a museum and they have a theater and uh, some people that I work with over the years, we would put together film events um, in the, for, at the New York State Museum. And it was 2011 and we were uh, mulling over different ideas for film events. We had done a lot of um, independent film showings from local films and we were trying to think of something different to do. And my friend, uh, Bruce Hallenbeck, who's also a filmmaker and writer, he, he's one of the uh, foremost authorities on Hammer Horror. He's written a lot of books on that. He said he suggested having a film festival for a filmmaker named Brett Piper, who he had corresponded with for years and years, but never met in person. And I said, you know, that sounds like a great idea. I hadn't heard of Brett. I hadn't heard of Mark. Uh, but uh, so we put together this film festival called the Muckman Movie Festival because Brett Piper had put out a film called Muckman, which Mark Polonia was a producer on. And so I quickly did some research and got a hold of some movies. I think one of the first ones I watched, which was a collaboration between them, was Splatter Beach. And I, I saw some videos of people talking about Mark. And um, so Brett emailed me to thank me. He said, I think I'm gonna bring my producer friend, Mark Polonia to this film festival. I said, sure, that sounds great. And as it turned out, uh, I got to uh, you know, enjoy the whole day with Brett, Mark, his son, Anthony, and a couple of my friends, Tim Hatch and another actor, James Corrales, another actor friend of mine. Uh, we skipped a couple of the movies in the festival and walked through downtown Albany and had some lunch. And uh, Mark and I just talked the whole day and we found we had a lot in common. We had a lot of the same sensibilities. We swapped stories about filmmaking. We said we'd stay in touch after that. And the next summer he called me up and said, hey, Jeff, I'm doing this movie called uh, Empire of the Apes in uh, Pennsylvania, sci-fi movie. Would you like to come down and play an ape? I said, you know, sure. And I actually, actually brought a couple actor friends of mine with, with me and he needed a couple of other people. So one of the leading ladies in that movie came with me or she went down to play in the movie. And um, my friend James Crowles, another actor who's been in a lot of Mark, Mark movies came down. And uh, then we did another movie, uh, Camp Blood 3 that fall. And just Mark and I became friends pretty quickly and he just keeps calling me back. I don't know why, but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, flash forward to now, and I've done over two dozen movies with him. We were actually, we did a count the last time I saw him. I don't know how we got into that conversation, but I think it's 26, he said it was. So, uh, yeah, it, it was just uh, right, a series of coincidences, right place at the right time, and, you know, <laughs> that's what happened. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he, he's, you know, it, 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 honestly, you've, at least in my mind, 
new Mark Polonia movies, you're almost synonymous with them to me at this point. Cause it's like, anytime there's a new Mark Polonia movie, <laughs> Jeff Kirkendall's in there somewhere, you know, it's really cool, you know? <laughs> well, I try, I, I missed a few, but I try to get in a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And you mentioned, so you mentioned kind of Camp Blood 3, First Slaughter. And in this one, I think, is this the one where you play is, I think the character is the Fletcher. He's kind of the, the, the harbinger of doom type character. Um, out, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, I don't, did you, uh, did you watch any of the earlier Camp Blood movies before you worked on that one? I think I, I think I did right before I shot that movie. I think I did watch at least the first one and maybe, or no, I think I watched the second one and they had a lot of flashbacks from the first one. Right. And, uh, but I wasn't really familiar with the franchise until until that came around. Not not really, but I, that was an exciting one. Actually, we had done Empire of the Apes, and we were, Mark and I were planning on doing another movie. He said, Dave Sterling's got this other script uh, we're going to do. I forget what it was. And he said, right, but right now I'm doing this Camp Blood thing, so I'll, I'll let you know when we do this other one. And I said, hey, Mark, if you need help on Camp Blood, I'll come down, because I, I had never gotten to be involved, really, in a slasher movie. I, I love those movies. So he said, all right, come down. And I wound up playing a role in that. And and then I became more familiar with the Camp Blood series, you know, after that, because I thought it was pretty interesting that there was this whole other series that was kind of based off of a line of dialogue in Friday the 13th, part two, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's interesting. It's a really interesting series. Right. And what I love about your character in that first one is, is, is playing that kind of that harbinger of doom is, is in the first camp blood there's the character of a uh, thatcher i don't know if you re recall that and that was played by an actor uh named joe haggerty who i'm a big fan of as well and i felt like your performance really kind of reminded me of that and that's why i kind of asked i wasn't sure if you had seen that and if you were like inspired with your performance at all or did you kind of try to do your own real thing with that one I, I tried to do my own thing there. Like I said, I wasn't all that familiar with the Camp Blood movies until afterwards. Uh, so, you know, I just kind of took the character as it was written. And, you know, I did kind of see that it was kind of inspired by that, that character in Friday the 13th, which I always, you know, it's a character I always liked. I thought that was a great character. Right. And so that was fun too, to be able to play something like that. You know, I saw that right away. And uh, it was fun working with, uh, it was a, you know, young cast teenagers and, you know, it had all the, the, the slasher trapping so you know i was really excited to work on that movie yeah and that was the first one you guys did and then you guys did i got it here somewhere it kills camp blood seven <laughs> and i gotta say of the later sequels because in, in a sense for people who aren't familiar they're kind of it is an original trilogy that was made by brad sykes and then later on david sterling produced a a bunch more sequels. Mark directed quite a few of them, but also some other directors directed them as well. And, uh, but to me, this one is the standout of those later sequels. I really love this one a lot. Can, can you tell us about working on, on, on this one in particular? Well, I agree with you. I, I think Camp Blood 7 came out really well. I think it hits all the bases, all the things people are looking for in those movies. Uh, for my own part, I got to play kind of a redneck character that, which was, Fun. Uh, I'm in the scene with this woman who plays my wife, one of Mark's regular actresses, and it's it just kind of this redneck couple, and that was fun. And we had a really good cast of people. Uh, Mel Heflin was in that one. Uh, Greta Volkova, who was, who was the, uh, the final girl character, I thought she was really good. Uh, I remember it being a lot of fun working on that one, and, and I did think the script was really, you know, one of the better ones I'd, I'd seen, and, you know, it was exciting to work on another slasher film and get to play a different character, but uh, I remember that being a good shoot, though. It was a lot of fun. And so, what kind of is a typical Mark Polonia shoot? Like, how, how many days do you, would you say that, that uh, one of those movies is typically shot over, do you know? Well, I'd say on average, it's usually anywhere between two and four days. I think the longest I've stayed would, it was maybe six, six or seven days. I think the one I remember being long was uh, a movie called uh, Amityville Death House, which was shot, I think, in it might have been 2000, geez, 2014, 2015, January. I remember it was really cold and 
ironically enough on that one, um, I worked mainly behind the scenes and I did a small part the last day of filming, but I worked with him quite a, quite a while on that one. Brett Piper worked on that one too. But uh, typically depending on the script and the complexity of the script, it's generally averages between two and four days, something like that. Right. And, and Mark uses a lot of the same actors and stuff like that. So is it kind of like a, a cool little family reunion when all you guys kind of get together to make one of these uh, movies? It is. It is. Uh, it's a rare Mark movie where I come and not know at least a good number of the cast members. Um, some of them, like I said, are people that from my area that I kind of brought with me to begin with. Um, I found I found Mark a few leading ladies that have come and worked. And then a lot of the other people are uh, what we would call Mark's regular people from the area, you know, and I, you know, got to know them pretty early on. So I always see them and we, we just have a really good time making these movies. You know, I like seeing everybody. Uh, Mark and I hang out a lot. You know, there's a lot of downtime. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's just, you know, that's all I can say about it. It's, you know, I really look forward to uh, these productions. It's, it's a good time. Very cool. <laughs> And so, so you also kind of help out behind the scenes as well? Is it kind of like everyone's kind of pitching in also behind the scenes as well as acting in the movies? Well, I think I think a lot of people do pitch in. I, you know, maybe I pitch in a, a little more than some of the actors because just because I have uh, filmmaking experience and, uh, you know, I might give my opinion on something and, and I help them, you know, carry, even just carry equipment around and, and things like that. Uh, but people do generally pitch in because, you know, everybody likes working with Mark because he's very personable and, uh, you know, people are usually willing to pitch in, you know, a lot of, a lot of people anyways. And, uh, you know, they know what goes into making his movies. So, you know, everybody's on the same page, basically. Right. And you guys actually have a couple of new movies coming out soon. I know one of them I was lucky enough to get to check out early, which was uh, Camp Murder. And uh, that one was really fun. I heard Wild Eye recently picked that one up. And uh, what what was uh, Camp Murder like? This time you actually played the killer in that one, I believe, right? Yes, yes. Uh, well, like I was talking about before, you know, I've always been a big fan of slasher movies. And uh, I guess the first I guess the first thing I did would be my clown story in Halloween Horror Tales as far as slashers go. And then Camp Blood 3 and Camp Blood 7. Uh, and, um, and yeah, in Camp Murder, uh, the producer on that, Will Colazzo, wanted me to play the mass killer. So, uh, so that was a lot. That was cool because I only had one line of dialogue in that movie. And, and I've done a lot of Mark movies where he will tend to um, he will tend to give me reams and reams of dialogue. He'll he'll give me the character with reams and reams of dialogue because he says that I I usually get it. I usually can rattle it off without too much problem. Uh, but that so Camp Murder was a lot of fun in that respect. I had one sentence. And I got to play the mass killer, um, got to meet some new people, some new, some new cast members on that one. Um, I thought it was interesting. I told you the story about Wave Productions and Psycho Sisters, but I got to be in that one and can't murder with Pamela Such, who was one of the Wave girls at the table back in the mid-90s. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. And uh, yeah, it was, it was what you would expect uh, for, uh, for that type of role. A lot of, uh, a lot of action sequences. Uh, you know a lot of stalking around and you know you you try to put a little character into it when you're behind the mask like that kind of like like for example Kane Hodder and in, in the Friday the 13th movies is always referring to that talking about what he does you kind of have to uh try to give your own take you know when you're you know totally covered up like that so I, th I thought it was pretty interesting um I thought that one came out really well I was really I was really happy with the way that movie came out it has all the elements. Uh, it moves. I thought. I thought it has. You know, uh, a lot of the a lot of the things the fans will like, and uh, it was a good experience. It was really. I think. Uh, I heard that. Uh, I heard the sub Rosa picked it up so well. Uh, oh, so yeah, I'm really. I'm really. I'm really glad they got the distribution on that one. It was definitely a different experience, and uh, yeah, it's 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 cool. <laughs> No, they, they, that one was really cool. And it, was that ever, because it does almost play like it could have been a Camp Blood movie. Was that ever, do, do you know, was it maybe originally intended as a Camp Blood movie and then it was just kind of switched over or was it always kind of its own entity? Uh, I, I don't know the origins behind that script. I know I know Will did an original uh, first draft on the script and then Mark added some stuff to it. 
Uh, there was never any discussion about the Camp Blood movie, so I don't, I don't think it has a connection to that. Uh, gotcha. But um, I think it has. I think it's a lot different than the Camp Blood movies. It has its own kind of style, and I, I really like. I think my favorite part is the uh, the wrestling angle, the wrestling character, <laughs> because I, I'm a huge wrestling fan, uh, and uh, Jamie Morgan, who plays that character, actually does wrestle. Besides being oh, wow. actor. And we actually, not full on wrestling scene, but there are some little wrestling vignettes in that movie. <laughs> I just got a kick out of that really. I thought it was just a nice little twist because it obviously, that movie obviously has some some very clear references or inspiration to certain really popular slasher movies or scenes where you can see that, which I thought was a good thing. But the wrestling angle was neat, I thought. It was different. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. I, I definitely recommend people check that one out when it comes out. I had a good time watching it. That's cool. And uh, that leads us to now. I don't have what it is, but I have the original here. Splatter Farm. Return to Splatter Farm. <laughs> now, I mean, to a lot of us SOV fans, Splatter Farm is considered just you know an absolute classic. It was the first Polonia Brothers movie that was widely distributed. For people to see they made it when they were just teenagers kind of how what was the genesis to make a sequel all these years later well i saw splatter farm and it's it's quite a memorable movie is the way i would put it, it, it it's, a, it's a memorable movie uh it has a lot of uh extreme elements in it it has a very homemade look and I mean, the thing that amazed me the most about it is uh, it was made by Mark and his brother when they were just teenagers. And I, I watch it and it's amazing that they were able to make a feature length movie at that age. And it has a story that it doesn't bore you. You watch it and you keep watching it. It's set in one location, but it keeps, it keeps your attention. Uh, and I, I was just really in awe of that. And, and, and also the story about all the success they had with that movie. And I just one day got to thinking about it and I started coming up with some ideas for a sequel. I, I just some ideas popped into my head and I was with Mark. We were shooting uh, the movie Amityville Exorcism and we were on a break waiting for a location to get opened up. I think they were waiting for a, a building to be opened up. And I said to him, I said to Mark, uh, would you ever consider making a sequel to Splinter Farm? He said he said he thought about it he would and he threw out some ideas and uh i didn't i didn't tell him i was thinking about writing a sequel but a lot of his ideas were very gelled with a lot of what i was thinking but i told him i'm going to send you something and i think it was took a couple months later i just sent him an email and said oh by the way i wrote a sequel to splatter from would you like to take a look and uh so i sent it to him he really liked it he uh made a few minor modifications added a few scenes and a couple of years later, we got around to doing it. And that was, that one is kind of unique in the fact that uh, most of Mark, Mark's movies are what you would call works made for hire because the distributor, say Wild Eye, will say, okay, here's, here's a story idea. Mark, write a script. And he goes, he writes a script and it's all set up for them when it's finished. But Return to Splatter Farm was kind of our, our project. We didn't have a distributor behind us. And, uh, in fact, I, I think Mark was saying a lot of people he pitched the idea didn't really weren't that interested in it. So we went ahead and said, we're going to go ahead and make this. And, uh, and then after it was finished, uh, you know, we were fortunate. Uh, we pitched it around. Mark pitched it to Wild Eye, and they were really happy to uh, get it. But, uh, but yeah, that movie, uh, the original Splatter Farm is really unique. And I was just, uh, I was just really impressed by it, you know, what they were able to do. And it's, you know, it's not like anything I'd seen before, so. Right, for sure. No, it's it's definitely a one-of-a-kind movie. And uh, did you find it? Because uh, it, uh, according to, you know, online, you, you guys, you co-directed this with Mark, right? So you guys kind of co-directed together? Uh, we, yeah, we kind of uh, co-produced and co-directed it together. Um, you know, I'd say Mark did a lot. Mark and uh, one of the actors, Nico Bryant, did a lot of the camera work. And, you know, Mark would set up a lot of shots and we would kind of consult on them. Uh, so, you know, he was nice enough to give me co-directing credit on it. But we produced the movie together and I did, you know, an acting part in it. And, uh, yeah, but it was a collaborative thing. You know, we, I was, we, we found a farm location and, you know, 
he set up, Merck set up a lot of the production in Pennsylvania. So, yeah, it was really, it was really an interesting experience. Right. Now, now I have to ask you, you make a, a sequel to Splatter Farm. Did you guys feel a need to up kind of the gore effects? Because I know Mark's movies lately, you know, probably over the last 20 years, the gore is always in there, but it's not as prevalent as it is in his early work like Splatter Farm and Church of the Damned and some of that other stuff. So did you guys kind of bump up the, the splatter factor for this? Um, I would say I would say yes. If I, in my script, I realized you know from the first movie that you would need to have a lot of that in this movie. And, and like you say, Mark's movies do have some of it, but I agree it's not it's not an overriding thing. So I did put I did uh, bump that up a bit. And in fact, uh, when Mark did a few tweaks to the script, I remember in particular he added more to I think the opening scene that I had, which I was surprised considering, like you said, his movies uh, aren't overly gory. Right. Uh, but yeah, oh, in general, we did. We did that. I thought it was appropriate for a Splatter Farm movie, a Splatter Farm sequel, and uh, yeah, we did that. Yeah. Nice. And and you're kind of, you're playing the Jeremy character, right? The Jeremy character comes back in this one. I remember when we were having the discussion about uh, Splatter Farm sequel, and we were sitting there, in addition, one of Mark's one of Mark's ideas, when he th was throwing out ideas to me, he said, if we were to do it, I definitely want you to play that part. Because I guess he saw saw me as visually close enough to what Jeremy would look like years later. And, you know, I kind of thought about it and said, oh, I, you know, I thought to myself, I probably do look, I'm probably in the ballpark, you know. But it was really flattering that he wanted me to play that. I wasn't, I wasn't considering roles or anything when I was, had the ideas for the script. Uh, but he said, right from the get-go that he wanted me to play the part. So, you know, I was really happy about that. And obviously Jeremy is a very kind of sadistic and sick character from the first film. Did you find it challenging playing that type of character as an actor? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, think that, I think that goes to sort of uh, the discussions we had about how, how much of the real uh, ex the extreme elements we were going to put in there, not just not just gore as in a Friday the 13th type of gore, but the the elements everybody remembers from that movie, the scenes everybody remembers. And um, Mark's general feeling is that he didn't want to go back and revisit that because because at this point, you, all these years later, there's so much that's been done, you really can't top what's been done in, 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 or even in that movie. Um, I think, in, I remember in the original script, I had an idea. My idea was to have kind of um, a little bit where you see some of that going on as a shadow on the wall. It goes away from the scene, and you see him doing a few things with the, sh the shadow on the wall. And I was, I was, I, I kept saying, you know, we got to keep that in there. And then as the process went on, I got to thinking about it more, and I said, you know, if we, if I leave that in there, actually, the people who want that, the fans who want that are going to see that little bit and they're going to say the rest of the movie is a cop out because it's not there. So I said, you know, we should get rid of that. We shouldn't do that either. And so, so we decided it would be more a, uh, uh, a, like a gory Friday the 13th stalker type of movie. And that's kind of what we went for. I mean, there are a little, a couple little hint elements in it left, I think, and one, one or two scenes, but I, we thought that would be the natural progression because you really can't top what was done in that movie. And just like I said, all the things that have been done in movies over the years, I think we thought it would be kind of a futile effort. And I don't think Mark was really interested in revisiting some of those scenes, you know, that people are anyway. So we hope uh, we hope it will be a standalone movie that people will like for its own merits. That's what I would say about it. Right. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm personally, I'm really excited about it. And that's coming out, I think, what is it, November 10th, I think I saw? Yeah, November tenth. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about it. Uh, it. It one thing it has a lot of is it has a lot of kind of like camp murder. It has a lot of homages to the slasher and the stalker genre. Uh, I think I think people will really like them, and um, has a lot of really creative kills. That was one of the things I really went for. I, I didn't want it to be just you know a, a knife in the head and the usual like this. There are a lot of creative kills. Uh, I, I think people will like. It. I hope they will like it. So. <laughs> nice very cool very cool cool well uh are there any other kind of upcoming projects you got coming up 
Um, let's see now. Um, the, 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 the most recent movie that came out that I worked with Mark on was uh, well, one called uh, Shark Encounters of the Third Kind, a science fiction movie that we shot a few years ago. That's a fun one. Uh, I've done actually, I think, three or four or five shark movies for Mark now. He's done a lot of those. Uh, that's a fun one with, uh, you know, a lot of uh, interesting visual effects and it's sharks versus aliens. And uh, that one's out now. Uh, and then there's uh, actually another shark movie. Uh, it's in the Jurassic Shark uh, series of movies that hasn't come out yet. Uh, so I'm waiting for that one. Then uh, there's a couple movies for Dave Sterling that still have to come out. There's another Empire of the Apes movie. It was called Invasion of the Empire of the Apes. Uh, we're playing the same characters in the other two movies, this character called Trask, kind of the good ape. Uh, so that one's coming out. And then uh, there's another uh, Camp Blood movie coming out that has it, I don't think it was, it was part of the box set, Camp uh, Children of Camp Blood. Uh, I had just a little bit part in that, kind of a, uh, the ghost of a character from another one of the previous movies. Uh, but I did get to see it and I think it's one of the better uh, Camp, Camp Blood movies. Uh, Although seven's probably still my favorite, though. <laughs> cool. <laughs> any so, any uh, chance you're going to be uh, directing again anytime soon? I would. I would like to do another movie myself. Uh, I just uh, I just bought a new camera, so I'm hoping to move up to what is it now? 4K. What, that's what we're, they're doing now. My previous camera was an HDV model with still using the mini tapes. That's what I shot uh, Halloween Horror Tales on. So hopefully, you know, I'll be moving up to something with, uh, you know, the real, real high def in the next, uh, the next few years. But I don't know what it will be yet. I, I'm working on a few scripts. Uh, they're all suspense and horror. I have a script. Uh, I have a script that uh, is a takeoff on uh, the uh, plant story, the, uh, the, the flower story in uh, Halloween Horror Tales, a full length script that uh, at the end of it brings back uh, a character from one of Mark's movies called Halloween Night. I'm hoping. I can convince Mark to collaborate on that one. It's a standalone movie, but it has a little appearance from a character from Halloween Night. Uh, but it's a plant, it's a killer plant movie. I'm hoping that hopefully we can do that. We'll see that. But he's very busy, but you know, maybe I'll shoot it in Albany. I don't know. <laughs> so. And that was another standout too. Uh, I, I watched that one with my wife and she absolutely loved the plant story. That was her favorite <laughs> of, of the movie. And I, I thought that one was really cool myself. That one's probably the most accessible to a general audience. If you were gonna, uh, you know, watch, watch it with uh, a non-horror audience, you might that one might be the one because it's kind of uh, it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty low low key and not not a lot of uh, over the top uh, <laughs> elements in it. <laughs> so, okay, right on. So, uh, any uh, anything else you want to plug or anything like that? Let people know about. Uh, well, uh, you know, I have a website, uh, VeryScaryProductions.com. I've been running that since uh, the early 2000s. Um, I have a, I update, uh, you know, everything I'm doing on that site. Although, obviously, today social media is the big thing, but uh, a lot of people got. It's interesting. A lot of people got rid of their websites. I remember the independent film scene here in Albany, as they say, back in the day, in the early days, you know, and then the 2000s, and everybody had a website. Uh, but um, yeah, I still run that. I have updates on that. And then I'm on all the social media. And um, let me see. I just uh, I did just work out with Mark on a a sequel to another one of his franchises. I won't say what it is yet, but it's a, a sci-fi thing uh, that I think a lot of people, <laughs> the hardcore fans, will be happy about. I had a little part in it. Uh, we just I hope it's it. what I, I think it is. <laughs> but I, I, I don't want to say it in case I'm not supposed to say it, but. Uh, it's another one of the famous Polonia franchises. So uh, <laughs> that uh, I'm, I'm guessing that will get done pretty soon. So, <laughs> so <That's awesome>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome, Jeff, it's, it's been great having you on and uh, thanks again, you know, for contributing to the Natasha Nighty movie. I don't know if you've, uh, I, I sent you copies. I'm not sure if you got them yet, but uh, I hope you enjoy the movie. Uh, personally, I thought your short was the perfect addition to it and i think people who are into kind of old school sov movies are really going to love this movie you know all the shorts not, not only yours but mine and ron ford's are all from the late 90s early 2000s so they're real vintage shorts and it's kind of in the usa up all night vein and i think uh 
I hope it takes people back to that era. I know, you know, I, I definitely pine for those days myself. So that, that was a good time. Uh, and uh, I look forward to watching uh, your movie and the other one. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity for a new distribution outlet, outlet for those movies, really. Uh, I was really excited when you uh, picked it, you know, uh, as part of an anthology. I, I, you know, I really appreciate it. I'm re very excited about it. And I hope, uh, you know, a new audience will see it. And yeah, I, yeah, it's great. It's great. It really is. I'm, I'm real happy about that. Well, that's what it's all about at SOV Horror. I always say it's all about the SOV love. You know, I think that's why we all do this. I'm, I'm sure you're no different. None of us are getting rich off of doing this. You know, we do it because we love the genre and we love making art, you know, and uh, it's so great to collaborate and meet other people who, who feel the same way, you know. Uh, I've worked on big Hollywood films and, and it's definitely a, a whole different ball game there, you know, where the independent films, you know, most of the people, not all of them, but most of them, you know, are in it for the right reasons because they create, they love creating art and they love the genre, you know, so it's, it's really cool. Right. Right. I, I've seen that too. It's uh, I, I, most of the people I've worked with have been really excellent and, you know, good people and it is a lot of fun and I like how everybody, you know, can be a part of the uh, filmmaking experience. You're not just a, a small, you know, bit in a giant machine. You're, you know, a more integral part of it. And, you know, I've enjoyed it too, definitely. Right. Awesome. Well, cool. Uh, any parting words before we uh, sign off here, Jeff? Uh, support, support SOV Horror. And uh, hopefully I'll have one of those cool t-shirts soon. I keep meaning to order one so I can be on the wall of SOV supporters and uh, support Tony's company. and. Uh, and thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Jeff. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for watching. And uh, just so you know, I'm going to take a couple week hiatus before the next episode. So there will be a little slight pause. I got a lot of movies I'm working on trying to get out to you guys. So I'm going to take a little break from the podcast. But we'll be back soon. And uh, maybe even we'll have Jeff back at some point. I'd love to have you on again, Jeff, uh, if you got a new project or maybe after Splatter Farm or something. And we can wrap some more about a uh, shot on video horror movies. Um, until then, everyone, we'll see you. Thanks for watching. Bye.